Well, thank you very much, Rena. It's a great honor to be here, uh, particularly to be in the home country of, of Tina Intelman, uh, one of your countrywomen who's been ambassador in New York at the United Nations and is now chair of the Assembly of State Parties of, of the International Criminal Court, which is one of the most important positions in the world of, of global criminal justice. Uh, you may wonder why an American is talking about the ICC. Uh, as I think most people know, uh, there are 121 countries in the ICC. Estonia is one of them. The United States is, is, is not one of them. Uh, but in the Obama administration, uh, we have engaged with the ICC. We've joined, as, as we have a right to, as a participant in the Rome Conference uh, in the annual meetings of the Assembly, and uh, now chaired by, by Tina, and uh, participated uh, in the debates. Uh, but we've gone further than that. Uh, we're also uh, supporting the court, uh, really, in every one of its cases around the world, in many cases uh, uh, providing more support than some of the state parties uh, when it comes to efforts to arrest and, and transfer the fugitives, when it comes to protecting and transferring uh, uh, witnesses, uh, uh, we're playing a very, very large role. Uh, the United States, as you may know, is very slow uh, to ratify uh, international conventions and treaties. It, it took us 40 years to, to ratify the Genocide Convention. Uh, uh, at the end of World War II, President Wilson was actively involved in the negotiation of the peace and proposed a League of Nations. Uh, he went back to uh, Washington and he couldn't get uh, the United States Senate to agree to the League of Nations. So uh, it, is, it is often a, a challenge in America convincing our American political process uh, to to become a member of international organizations. But when it comes to international justice, uh, we're doing everything that, that we can, not just in supporting the ICC, uh, but in the leadership that we provided uh, to the various tribunals that uh, began to be established by the United Nations in 1993 for the former Yugoslavia uh, and for Rwanda, which were created by the Security Council but also other tribunals that were called into being uh, by the United Nations and which were then formed in agreements with, with countries that had had horrible conflicts uh, and uh, the international community. And as, uh, as, as uh, Rena said, I was involved in, in two of them as chief of prosecutions at the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda for six years, uh, prosecuting uh, the leaders of the Rwanda genocide, the murder of 800,000 men, women, and children over the course of a period of only 100 days in 1994, uh, leading the trial of the media leaders and later uh, uh, coordinating the, the trials of, of the military and political leaders responsible for those crimes. Uh, and then at the end of 2006 was asked by Secretary General Annan to become chief prosecutor in Sierra Leone of the court, uh, the, the mixed court, uh, an agreement between the international community and the government of Sierra Leone to try the persons responsible for atrocities that had uh, resulted in thousands of people having hands and limbs uh, amputated, uh, uh, tens of thousands of people being murdered, uh, hundreds of thousands of women and girls uh, being sexually exploited. And we charged the leaders of armed groups and, and also, of course, the president of the neighboring country, uh, President Taylor of, 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 of Liberia. Um, this uh, topic today has to do with protecting victims and, and, and providing justice. And uh, I think we have to focus on, on what the problem is today. And of course, we're talking about human rights, but we're talking about the most serious violations of human rights, those in which people are, 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 are attacked physically, uh, uh, mutilated, uh, as they were in Sierra Leone, or, or raped, or, or murdered in, in, in enormous numbers. And, and it is, as, as Rena said, we're not in the same situation we were in the age of more interstate armed conflict, like World War I or World War II. Uh, today, uh, almost, all of the, almost all of this is happening within civil conflicts, sometimes in war, sometimes uh, not even uh, in, in what would be called a, a civil war under, under international law. And, and the perpetrators are often armed groups uh, that, that prey on the civilian uh, population, hoping uh, to gain uh, uh, power within a state or in, in part of a state in order to control uh, uh, mineral wealth and, 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 and the power that, that, that comes with it. 
Uh, it can also involve uh, oppression, violent oppression, by, by state actors who are, who are facing potential overthrow, as, as we saw in Libya, where as, as, uh, as the Arab Spring uh, spread to Tripoli and, and Benghazi, and, and as people went to the streets, uh, uh, the government uh, came down as hard as possible on their own population, uh, shooting people as they, as they left uh, their Friday prayers in the mosque, or, or threatening them, uh, to saying that they would chase them down like rats, uh, uh, street to street and house to house, uh, uh, even into their closets. Uh, the kind of violence that we're now seeing in Syria, of course, which then many times leads finally to, to armed resistance and, and to the danger that the groups that are engaged in that armed resistance uh, may begin to, to take uh, uh, reprisal action against uh, uh, civilians or others uh, that are viewed as associated uh, uh, with, uh, with the regime. And then we have instances of, of ethnic or religious conflict that some of us are, may from a distance see as, as almost spontaneous, but certainly if you've looked at them, quite often you'll discover that there are leaders, there are people that are in there that are instigating it, that are financing it, that are doing it uh, in ways uh, to benefit uh, their uh, economic uh, or, or, or political interest. What we've tried to develop globally, we did a bit uh, after World War II with the Nuremberg trials, but then during the period of the, of the Cold War, there was no action in this area until the 1990s, uh, is, to, is, a, is a criminal justice model. And indeed, my own experience was as a prosecutor in my home state, uh, where the, the focus was on prosecuting crime in order to protect people uh, from predatory uh, uh, criminals. Uh, and the model here is the idea that through uh, criminal prosecution, uh, we may be able to, to achieve uh, globally in places where people are not protected, uh, the same kind of protection that we're able to achieve uh, in, in developed societies uh, when it comes to combating more ordinary sorts of, of, of crime and, and violence. Uh, you know, as, as it was said, I think, by many in the past, uh, you know, if you murdered one man in most societies, uh, you could look forward to perhaps being arrested. Uh, if the police were effective and if you were arrested and the evidence was strong, being convicted and, and punished. Uh, but uh, in, these, uh, in these situations of, of armed conflict or in, in civil conflict, uh, you have uh, situations where individuals who murdered thousands or tens of thousands, uh, really had no expectation of a punishment. Uh, it was heads they win, uh, they stay in power, they, they continue uh, uh, their, their ruthless ways, or tails they don't lose, uh, they might go into a safe and comfortable exile somewhere and, and, and live on, on some of their uh, <laughs> ill-gotten gain. And so uh, the idea of, of, of international criminal justice is, is, is to bring that to an end. Now the question is, uh, you know, what does, it, what does it offer? What can it accomplish? And, and, and of course the challenge is in, in making it effective and, and, and credible. But certainly we have seen situations where it does have the effect uh, by going in and threatening prosecution uh, and by arresting some of the perpetrators and driving some of the others off or, or, or underground uh, where it can remove uh, from, a, from a conflict situation the individuals that are committing uh, the most horrendous crimes. Now, I know sometimes when I, when I get engaged in, in situations in Africa and elsewhere, uh, people will say, uh, this, this is unfair, you're focusing uh, unfairly on Africa, you're focusing unfairly on, on, on certain regions of the world and, and, and certain perpetrators. Uh, frankly, I never hear that from victims. I remember when we established the Rwanda Tribunal in, in 1994, the, the, the plea from, from Africa was, uh, you know, well, you established a tribunal for the former Yugoslavia in 1993. There are perhaps 100,000 civilians that have been killed in the former Yugoslavia. This is horrendous. But here in Africa, we have 800,000 killed in the Rwanda genocide. Uh, don't victims count in Africa, too? Shouldn't there be justice there? And, and the world reacted to that by establishing the, the Rwanda tribunal. Now the ICC is focusing a lot on African countries, but if you talk to the victims in any one of those situations, uh, they're thrilled. 
They want to see those perpetrators uh, taken out of there. They want to see uh, persons uh, uh, held, uh, held to account. And indeed, when, when there are judgments uh, in these cases, I remember in the, in the media trial where we had a 34-month trial and we charged the, the individuals that were um, the directors of RTLM radio in Rwanda, which you probably heard was sometimes called hate radio. Its, its messages were sometimes more subtle than presented in the, in, in the movies, but essentially they called on people to, to hunt down the cockroaches. And indeed, when you begin to hear rhetoric that refers to political opponents or human beings as, uh, as bugs or snakes or, or, or some other kind of vermin, uh, tru truly watch out. And uh, uh, this radio became a major force for inciting the genocide and was also a force for command, control, communication that would actually direct the militias uh, toward uh, uh, hiding places of, 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 Tut of members of the Tutsi ethnic group. Um, and it was a very complicated case proving the relationship between the communication uh, and the action by the killers. It was a very challenging thing in particular to show that these directors had control of the radio during the specific time. But eventually, we won historic convictions uh, against the leaders, uh, the first convictions in the history of the world for direct and public incitement by, by the leaders of the mass media. And I remember one victim who came up to me after the trial, and, and he said, this is, this is the greatest day of my life. And I said, you know, and frankly, as a prosecutor, I was always frustrated that I was doing so little for victims, because quite often there's, there's nothing really available in, in these courts in terms of reparations. There, there's hope that there will be uh, in, the, in the ICC. But, um, but, you know, as he said, uh, you know, what I saw here was men that were so big and so powerful that I couldn't even approach them. Uh, that were absolutely uh, beyond the, the reach of the law or, or beyond the reach of reason. And, uh, and now they've been condemned by the international community. And, and the suffering that my family experienced, the death of my, of my children, the death of my sister because of these kinds of, uh, of, of, of inciting broadcasts, they've been recognized and, uh, and, and, and the world has basically declared the wrongfulness of, of, of this conduct. The dream, of course, is that by these kinds of actions, we can deter the crime. And of course, deterrence, uh, even in a national justice system, is always something very hard to prove, uh, whether any particular punishment deters. And of course, we know that no matter how effective law enforcement is, uh, there will be people committing crimes uh, no matter what. Uh, but we also know that when it's effective and when it's fair and when you've got a proper judicial system, and we've seen this in the way that uh, the, the, the crime has been reduced in, in my own country, uh, you can begin to protect uh, uh, individuals. In, in Sierra Leone, after our prosecutions there, and we prosecuted uh, armed groups on, on both sides of the conflict, that country that had gone through this horrendous uh, uh, period of, of, of violence uh, then has since gone through three elections, uh, one of which uh, reversed power in that country, uh, in which the opposition won and, and, the, uh, and the government had to, to surrender power. And each of those elections have been fought uh, uh, without, uh, without violence, uh, uh, without lethal violence in any case, sometimes some, some, some big demonstrations and that kind of thing, but, ne but not the kind of uh, horror that occurred in the past. And, and the message has clearly been sent that you don't gain power uh, through, uh, uh, through, through violent means. Additionally, you know, we have seen uh, this sort of dream that, that justice could reach very powerful men. Uh, it was expressed by Justice Jackson at, at Nuremberg, uh, where he said that the common sense of mankind uh, tells us that uh, the law should not stop with the punishment of, of petty crime by little people, but must reach men who possess themselves of great power and make deliberate and concerted use of it to set in motion evils which leave no home in the world untouched. And, and now we've you know, held a prime, former Prime Minister of Rwanda, Kambanda, uh, guilty of, of genocide. Uh, uh, Slobodan Milosevic has been brought to trial in The, in, in the Hague and in the, in the Special Court for Sierra Leone, former President Charles Taylor has been convicted uh, of, for war crimes and crimes against humanity and sentenced to, to 52 years. Uh, now there's the sense that, that powerful individuals can be held to account. And people say, well, it changed them. Well, 
perhaps for those that are that are that are already in their bunkers, uh, perhaps not, but uh, for others. Uh, and, and, and certainly as someone that, that understands uh, political leaders and have spent a, a fair amount of time with them, I mean, people who get to these sorts of levels, no matter what society they're in, are people that got there through careful calculation of what the benefits or what the risks were of various strategies for, for gaining and holding power. And I think that we're beginning to see uh, that calculation change. Uh, uh, you see it even in a place like Kenya, which has traditionally had uh, violence uh, that accompanied uh, each of its election periods. Now you have senior leaders being held to account. Many thought that it would lead to further violence. In fact, there hasn't, uh, uh, there, there hasn't been any information that we have is that people now realize that, one of the, that it's no longer possible to, to sort of gain advantage uh, uh, by going out and intimidating another group by sending out the thugs to kill uh, uh, hundreds of the, of, of, of the civilians that are associated with that group, that that kind of conduct uh, is, is no longer possible or, 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 or beneficial. The challenge, I think, of all of this is how to, how to make it effective. And, uh, you know, at the ICTY, the Yugoslavia Tribunal, because of, of, of uh, the kind of global uh, and, and regional efforts uh, to ensure cooperation with that court, it was possible eventually for every one of the 161 individuals charged by that court to be brought to justice. Uh, as I think everybody remembers, the EU basically said uh, the countries of the Balkans, uh, the Western Balkans, won't be able to join the, the uh, EU unless they fully and completely cooperate with the court. And, and others conditioned uh, aid on that. And that made it possible to bring uh, people to justice. Now with the ICC, we've had about six arrests for that court. I think there are 12 individuals that are under arrest warrants that are out there uh, that are not responding to those arrest warrants. And, and that calls for, I think, major efforts internationally uh, to make sure that uh, contact is restricted with individuals that are under indictment, that uh, there are consequences uh, to them and their countries uh, uh, for the failure to comply with, uh, uh, with, these, uh, with these orders, or we will lose uh, some of the benefit of what we've gained by these cases if we don't make it clear that there are consequences, that individuals that are charged with these crimes in a, in a neutral international system need to face justice and, and, uh, and have their opportunity, have their day in court, have their opportunity to defend themselves. And, uh, uh, but it, it has to be a credible process. I should note, of course, that what happens at the international level uh, is only a small part of this. <laughs> Uh, and, and should push for, uh, for, for more effective prosecution at the national one. And that's something I think we've had in the Balkans, uh, even while people there are not always uh, satisfied with what the Yugoslavia Tribunal has done. Each of the countries, Croatia, uh, Serbia, Bosnia, has engaged in national prosecutions of, of mid-level and lower-level war criminals, uh, sometimes uh, 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 by, by persons of their own nationality who, who victimized others. And I think that the fact that that's happening is to some extent a reflection of international justice, but probably the most important uh, uh, part of it. Finally, I'd note that, that obviously, you know, I, I mentioned uh, Syria uh, is a situation where the international community has not yet been, been able to, to, to be involved in terms of being able to, to bring international justice to bear. But um, the, uh, just because there is not yet a court uh, does not mean that the international community doesn't have a role and can't begin to, uh, uh, to move this forward. Uh, we see it in the commissions of inquiry established by the Human Rights Council, of which Estonia is now becoming a member, and, uh, and, and other uh, commissions of inquiry that have been established multilaterally, like the one that was established on Kyrgyzstan, in which Rain Mullerson of Estonia was a member that established uh, the facts uh, through, a, through a fair and, 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 and careful uh, process and lay the foundation uh, for justice later. Uh, we're also, uh, in the Syrian context, we've developed an accountability center working with Syrians now to, to actually begin to develop the cases 
not just on the government side, but if there are perpetrators on the, on, on the rebel side as well, uh, so that cases are developed, so that uh, when there is an opportunity for justice at the national level after transition in a hybrid court that might be established within the region, or at the international level if it goes to the ICC, uh, the information is there in order to have a fair process. Um, this is a, is a work in progress, as, as justice always is, but the world, I think, is very different now than it's been in, in the past because it is possible uh, to hold the perpetrators of the worst crimes, you know, the humankind, uh, uh, responsible for those crimes. And even though it's not happening everywhere in every situation, the signal has, has been sent, and I think uh, if we continue to work with that process and, and provide it with the, uh, the political support and, and, and leverage that, uh, that it requires, uh, we can, I think, have a greater hope that the worst crimes uh, that are being committed, the worst violations of human rights being committed against our fellow human beings uh, can indeed be prevented and the victims of those crimes protected. Thank you very much.